right, well, happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Thank you, Brenda, for that special music. Really appreciated it. And welcome to all our visitors. We seem to have a, quite a few of them today, so welcome. And also for those that are on the webcast, hello to you as well. Well, brethren, I'd like to begin today in Revelation chapter 21. We'll read verses 7 through 8. And I've been thinking about something for the last few months, and this scripture was re read at the feast. And I believe it was Mr. Shaby that read it, and it really sparked something in my mind. This is Revelation chapter 21, verse 7. It says, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Well, notice something here, brethren. What's listed first? It's cowardly. It's cowardly. You know, we don't, at least I haven't talked very much about that in the past. But what does it mean to be cowardly that the Apostle Paul is referring to here in Revelation 21, verse 8? Well, what's the definition of a coward? A coward is one, according to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a coward is one who shows disgraceful fear or timidity. What is cowardice? It's a lack of courage or firmness of purpose. And what's the opposite of cowardice? It's courage. Courage. And what's courage? It's mental or moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand danger, fear, or difficulty. So brethren, the time is going to come when those who follow what this book says and have the testimony of Jesus Christ will suffer persecution as the end of the age approaches. And a time of unprecedented trouble will engulf the entire world. It's going to engulf the entire world. And a time is going to come when you and I are going to have to make a stand. A stand as to whether we will obey God or if we will give in and go with the world which is going to follow a coming personality and a system that is called the beast by God's word. And it's going to be very, very seductive. It's going to be deceptive and it's going to seem at first like it's really good. And in fact, it's probably going to seem like it's an answer to a huge financial crisis that's going to come. But I ask you and I ask myself, will we have the courage, the spiritual courage, to stand firm in our conviction, in our obedience to God, or will we fold when it becomes increasingly difficult to stand firm? Will we fold? Today we're going to look at spiritual courage. We're going to look at five keys to developing the courage that we are going to critically need in the future. Perhaps a future that is coming relatively soon. We don't know, but it may be. But we still have some time right now to develop that courage with God's help, and we must do it. We have to do it. And I've entitled this message, Five Keys to Spiritual Courage. Let's look at the first key to developing spiritual courage. That is that we must, we must develop a strong relationship with God. We must have a strong relationship with God. Let me just read a couple of scriptures to you. James 4, verse 8. Through James, God says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. If we make an effort to draw near to God, he draws near to us. Because he wants us to draw near to him. 
In Proverbs 8, verse 17, let me just read that scripture. It says, and this is through David, I love those, and God speaking and inspiring, I love those who love me, and those who seek me will find me. I love those who love me, and those who seek me will find me. Are we seeking God? And I'm asking myself this, brethren, as well. Let's look over in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. This is talking about what's going to happen to Israel in the future, but really for all mankind. It says, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Do we seek God with all our heart? What does it mean to do that? Well, I, this is point number one. I have three subpoints, so I'll call the first one 1A. So it's subpoint A, and that is that we must seek God in prayer and study of His Word and meditation and fasting. And we've heard this, haven't we, many times? But it's so so important. Let me just read to you a few scriptures for each one of these. In Romans 12, verse 12, Paul is admonishing the Romans to continue steadfastly in prayer. That is, to keep praying on a regular basis. You know, it, it's so easy, isn't it, to pray, and we, we can be praying every day, we're doing well, and then maybe something happens and we stop for whatever reason. And so then it goes on for a while, and then you start praying again, so you go in cycles. But that's not good. We need to be praying every day. And you know what? We can pray for God to help us to pray every day because we need to. We need God. We need to draw close to him and be strong in our relationship with him. Another one is study. Are we regularly studying? Let me just read Matthew 4. This is Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Quoting Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. This is the word of God. It's right in front of us. We have it. Are we, are we living by it? Are, is it important enough to study it on a regular basis as well? Because we have to know this book inside and out. In Psalm 11, verse 2, we won't turn there for time considerations, but David writes something very interesting. He says, The words of the Lord are great, and studied by all who have pleasure in them. Do we study what God has revealed to us in his word? Do we know it inside out? Meditation. Again, from David. This is Psalm 119, verse 15 through 16. I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. I will not forget it. First, you have to know it, you have to study it, but then don't forget it and think about it. Do we think about what we read in God's word? Do we think about the things of God on a continuing basis during our day, sometimes just being thankful for little things that we have? And there are so many. And God's blessing of us is so incredible. There's so much to think about. Do we do it? And then fasting. Fasting is a way, brethren, a powerful tool for us to humble ourselves and to seek God's will. And we need to use it as needed because it's a powerful tool to help us draw closer to God. Let's look at another sub-point. This is still key number one, a strong relationship with God, but it's sub-point B, and that is to yield to God, to yield to him. Let me read a couple of scriptures to you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says, Therefore humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. We need, brethren, 
to be actually growing in humility. And I'm preaching to myself as well. Are we growing in humility? Are we saying, well, I, I'm, I'm humble. I feel like I'm humble. But are we stagnant? Are we becoming more and more humble? Because you know what? All of us need to be more and more humble, don't we? I know I do. And this ties into prayer. God will help us to be more humble. In, in Proverbs 3, verse 5, a very familiar scripture. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. This is such a profound scripture, but to truly do this, brethren, we need something. We need to be humble. We need to be humble to really trust in the Lord and not lean on our own reasoning and understanding. But then there's more to really trust in the Lord and not lean on understanding. We need humility and we need something else. If you'll turn with me to James chapter 4, verse 7. James chapter 4, verse 7. It says, therefore, submit to God. Then resist the devil and he will flee from you. Submit to God. And we must submit to God. We must submit our life and our will to God. And I know that sounds like, okay, that seems good, but are we actually doing it? Are we allowing God to lead us? And are we willing to give up what we want to do to serve God? James, excuse me, in Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Let's turn there. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. We must allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit of God. That still small voice within us, brethren, or that thought that comes in our mind of what we should be doing. Do we follow it when we know that it's right? Or do we try to follow our own will and our own reasoning? Here in Romans 8, verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. The things of the Spirit are the things of God and not the things of this world. Are we willing to submit ourselves to God and not serve the things of the world? And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. But let's notice Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. I'll give you a moment. Matthew 6, verse 33. It says, Seek first the kingdom of, the, of God and his righteousness, and all things shall be added to you. These are the words of Jesus Christ. To truly do this, brethren, it takes humility and submission to God. And it takes something else. And this is our point C. We're still in key number one strong relationship with God. This is point C. God must be at the center of your life. I'm spending a little bit more time on this first point. But God must be at the center of your life and my life. Let me read to you Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 through 3. This is when God is giving the Ten Commandments to ancient Israel. And he says, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Brethren, all of us have been brought out of the land of Egypt. We've been brought out of this world and separate, to be separate from the world. And God has opened our minds to see and understand and he's broke the bondage of deception in our minds. 
He says, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods, small g, before me, unquote. We can't have any other gods before the true God. And that includes everything. That includes everything that we may own or want to own, anything that's physical. It includes anyone else. And it includes even ourselves, our own pride, and even our own life. There can be no God, false God, at the center of our life. It must be the true God. In Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 28. Let's turn there real fast. We're not too far away. Luke chapter 10, verse 25 through 28. I'll give you a chance to get there. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, Jesus saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he, Jesus, said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. We must love God with all of our heart and all of our life, brethren, and all of our strength and mind. We must love God more than ourselves, more than anything else in this world around us. We must love God, and it must be at the center of our being. there is something else, brethren, God will help you to remove it from the middle of your heart. Because that's where he belongs. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, I'll just read it to you. It says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. If we truly love God in the depth of our being, then we will keep his commandments. And that includes being here today. That includes keeping his law and submitting ourselves to him. And it includes serving God and not mammon. We won't turn there in Matthew 6, verse 24. It says, you cannot serve God and mammon. God must be first. You cannot have any other God in your heart before him. God must be at the center of our life, at the core of our heart. So in summary, this I spent more time on this point, but in summary, we must have a, con, a continuous connection to God, and God will help us to do that. We must yield to God, including obedience and being led by the Holy Spirit within us, and God must be at the center of our life, and we must love him more than everything and everyone else. We must have a strong relationship with God or we will not be able to be spiritually courageous when the time comes. We won't be close to God. He won't be at the center of our heart. And so we could be drawn away when the pressure comes, when the persecution comes. Let's look at the second point that we'll look at today. Key to spiritual courage. It is we must have a deep love of the truth. We must have a deep love of the truth. In John chapter 8, verse 32, I'll just read it to you. But Jesus says, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, how does the truth make us free? You know, the truth sets us free from deception, and deception is a powerful form of enslavement. And deception leads to sin and darkness and the lack of peace. And the truth includes the understanding and the blessing of the true Sabbath and God's holy days, which point to the plan of salvation for mankind. 
It teaches us, brethren, about the future as well, about heaven and hell. And when we see what is going on in this world, we haven't lost hope for our, even our relatives because we know the truth. And it's a comfort to us. It sets us free from all this anxiety that deception brings. We know that God is not a trinity, but that God dwells within us by the Holy Spirit that, that strengthens us and guides us and helps us and leads us. And it's going to eventually transform our fleshly body into a spirit body. And we know, brethren, why humanity has the nature that it has. God's truth reveals why, but it also reveals the incredible potential of every human being and that they, each person will be given a fair chance for salvation. And the truth reveals that process of conversion and salvation. And the truth reveals what's coming in the future, brethren, the coming kingdom of God and the expansion of the divine family of God. You know, the truth encompasses all of this and, and more. We've only touched on the truth. But the truth is a fantastic gift from God, the understanding of the truth that we have. And not just the understanding, but the conviction that we have. Because we can tell others elements of the truth, and I have. Some of my friends that have asked me, and their eyes gloss over, I've mentioned this. They just gloss over. They don't understand it. God has given us a fantastic gift, brethren. Do we love it? Do we love the truth? Notice John chapter 14, verse 16 through 17. John chapter 14, verse 16 through 17. It says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that it may guide you, that it may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth, which the world cannot receive, because it neither sees it nor knows it, but you know it, for it dwells with you and will be in you. The Holy Spirit, brethren, is the spirit of truth, because it leads us to the truth by opening our minds to understand and also to be convicted of the truth. To know that you know, that you know that it's the truth. We're here in John, notice John 16 verse 13, it's not far away. Again, the words of Jesus, however, when it, the spirit of truth has come, it will guide you into all truth, for it will not speak on its own authority, but whatever it hears it will speak and it will tell you things to come. The Holy Spirit guides us to truth and to be convicted of it. Notice John 17, 17, since we're, we're right here, brethren. 17, 17. Jesus says, sanctify or set them apart by your truth in his prayer to the Father. He says, your word is truth. And brethren, we have been separated from the world by our understanding of the truth. And what a fantastic blessing it is. But notice Psalm chapter 25, verse 4 through 7, if you would, please. Psalm chapter 25, verse 4 through 7. I'll give you a moment to get there. Psalm 25, verse Psalm of David. David writes, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I will wait all the day. So he says, Lead me in your truth. Now David had a close personal relationship with God and it really shows in this passage you can see the sincerity that David is saying to God as he asked God to lead him in the truth 
So we see the connection of the truth in our relationship with God. The combination of the truth and a relationship with God, it leads to even more. And it's here in Psalm 86, which isn't too far away. It leads to something else, the, the truth and our relationship with God. Chapter, Psalm 86, verse 11. says, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. To walk in the truth, brethren, and to unite or to have singleness of heart. So he says, he's praying for singleness of heart, to fear or to honor your name. We must walk in the truth and continuously act upon it, brethren, with a heart of respect and honor to God, which is what the truth brings about in us. It points us to God in love and respect and to walk with him in the truth. The truth tells us where we're going, where we're headed, and how fantastic it is. It tells us about God and his plan. It gives us the Sabbath. It gives us all these things. How grateful are we for it? And what does all of it boil down to? Notice Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 through 10. This is a very interesting scripture. It is a warning. Second, Second Thessalonians 2, verse 9 through 10. It says, The coming of the lawless one, is according to the working of Satan. What is that? That is this beast that is coming. It's a person and a, a system. Coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, the beast and the false prophet, and with all right, unrighteous deception among, among those who perish because they did not receive what? They did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. So, do you love the truth? We must do it. We must love it. Do we cherish it? Do we cherish the truth? Is it in the core of our heart along with God? Because if it's not, brethren, we will not stand with it when the time comes and we will fall away we won't have the spiritual courage because we will not have loved the truth as it says here that they did not receive the love of the truth it's a warning brethren we must love the truth let's look at the third key and it is we must have a real vision of the future and I say real, it must be real to us. We must have a real vision of the future. If you go back with me to Psalm chapter 8, and we'll read verses 3 through 6. Psalm chapter 8, verse 3 through 6. I'll give you a moment to get there. Psalm chapter 8, verse 3. Again, David writes, When I consider your heavens, referring to God, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, and how incredible they are, brethren. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him for you have made him a little lower than the angels and you've crowned him with glory and honor you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands and you put all things under his feet you know this is such a beautiful and a, a profound passage that is written by David it acknowledges the greatness of God and the wonder of the creation 
And the creation itself points to the greatness of God for those whose minds are open to see it. But then it goes on to the very purpose of human life, that mankind was created with the potential to be crowned with glory and honor and to have all things put under his feet. This is an element of the truth as well, isn't it? We won't turn there, but in Hebrews 1, 1 verse 13, it says, But to which of the angels has he, referring to God, ever said, Sit at my right hand while I make your enemies your footstool? And referring here in Hebrews to Psalm 110 and David's writings. And it refers to David's enemies being put as his footstool, but also for all mankind. The potential of man is to be above the angels. And this is profound considering that angels have eternal life and they have enormous power when compared to humanity. But the potential of mankind is to be far greater than that, to be part of God's divine family itself. Notice 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. This phrase, partakers of the divine nature, brethren, is astounding. This is the incredible potential of you and me and all the first fruits and eventually all mankind. Does this resonate with you? When you read this verse, does it resonate? Is it real to you or is it just head knowledge? Is the hope for this, brethren, to, be, to become like God in glory and to share the divine nature of God? Is the hope for that also at the core of our being? Do we think about it? We talked about meditation earlier. Do we think about this? Because it puts everything into perspective, doesn't it? When God, as he's opened our mind to understand the truth, has revealed to us this incredible fact that is going to occur, this incredible thing that we will become part of his family and that we will see him as he is. How real is that to you? Or do we just read it and say, yeah, that sounds nice. Is it real? Do we hope for it? Do we put other things in perspective when we're comparing them to this? Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 16. The apostle Paul writes something very interesting that, to the uh, Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 16. Second Corinthians four, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. And it is. We're getting older, aren't we? And we have health issues. And there are problems with the flesh and the physical. But yet the inward man, the spiritual, is being renewed day by day by God's Spirit within us. And then he goes on, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That weight of glory is what we shall be in the future, brethren. Well, we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Is what is not seen, brethren, real to us? 
Do we have a real vision of it in our mind? As God has opened us to see it and to understand it and to be convicted of it. Notice next Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> Incredible chapter in God's word. Romans chapter 8. Another very familiar scripture to us. Romans chapter 8, verse 16 through 18, and then verse 23. 23 excuse me. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if heirs, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. In order for this to actually be true, brethren, in our mind, the vision of our future must be real in our mind. And that nothing compares to what we will be in the future. To be part of God's family and to have eternal life and to share his glory. And then things beyond what we can imagine, God reveals or says to us, it is too wonderful to even understand at this point in time for us. But do we have a burning hope for what God reveals is coming in our future? Are we willing to take a stand for it when the time comes? In John chapter 3, verse 2, I won't, I'll just read it to you. We won't turn there, brethren. But it says, John writes, Beloved, now we are children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he, Jesus, is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. How incredible this is. If we are alive, when Jesus Christ returns, we will be changed. And if we're not, those will be resurrected. And we'll be glorified and be like Jesus Christ, our elder brother. And we shall see him and the Father in their full glory. Because we'll be like them. We will also be glorified. Is the vision of this future within you? Is it also deep in your heart? It must be. It must be. Let's look at one more scripture here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. One more scripture along with this point. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. It said, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. What is that hope? It is the hope of glory, brethren, and the hope of our calling. It says, for he who promised it to us, almighty God, is faithful and he will make it happen, brethren. You know, we must hold fast, as it says, the confession of this hope within us. We must grab onto it with a, with a vice-like grip and hold it close to our heart. It must be there. It must be very close to us. So much so that we cherish it. Remember we talked about cherishing the truth. We cherish this hope of what the truth reveals to us. Because if we don't have that hope burning within us and close to our heart, we will fall away when the testing of our faith comes. But if we have it, we understand that no matter what they do to us or what happens, nothing can take it away because he who promised is faithful and nothing compares to it, even suffering and even martyrdom. Let's look at the fourth key. And we must have the right treasure at our core. And this ties into the sermonette and we did not collaborate. 
I appreciated the gold coin. I wanted to keep it, but somebody else took it from me. <laughs> I've never come into church and had somebody give me a gold coin, so it was great. But this ties in directly, brethren. We, we must have the right treasure at our core. In Luke 12, verse 34, we're not going to turn there, but it says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What do you value most? What do you value most? You know, God tells us in his word what it cannot be. Notice 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9 through 10. It says, Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, if you put being rich and money and all those things that money can buy, if you put that as the priority in your life, you will fall into temptation and a snare. Because the pursuit of riches brings about a snare. You get, you get caught up into it. And you will eventually compromise. You're, there's a huge temptation to compromise, to obtain what you want. As it says, the snare includes many foolish and harmless lusts. Because money can enable those things. Is that what our treasure should be, or even the desire for it. It says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil and leads to being pierced through with many sorrows. You know, money and physical things cannot be the treasure of our heart. It just can't be. Why? Because it pushes out God. And it corrupts us and that physical treasure corrodes and it declines and it doesn't fulfill you know as human beings we can think well if I only had a million dollars you know my life would be better or 10 million or 100 million or whatever or I was a billionaire but would it from a spiritual standpoint would it no because money and physical things cannot be the treasure of our heart because it leads to destruction because it pushes God out. Now you can be a billionaire and you can be a first fruit, but your money and treasure cannot be at the center of your being. If you'll turn with me, brethren, to Matthew chapter 13. This is very similar to, <clears throat> pardon me, what Carl was just talking about, Mr. Rothenbacher. Uh, Matthew chapter 13, I picked a different one in the same area when Jesus was speaking and giving the parables. Matthew 13, verse 45. Again, the kingdom of heaven <clears throat> is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. What is the pearl of great price? It is your calling. That God has brought about within you by his spirit. That he's opened your mind to understand the truth that we've talked about already. And it is the hope within us for the kingdom of God and for the glory and sonship in the family of God that we've also just talked about. That is a pearl that God is offering us. Are we willing to sell all that we have for that pearl and for what God is going to give us? Eternal life in his very family. If you hold your place here in Matthew, brethren, and, but we're not going to turn out. Let me just read to you first Luke 14. Because 
this is what I was thinking about before the scripture of in Revelation 21 at the feast and the brought up cowardice. Luke 14, verse 33, let me just read it to you. It says, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. And he did just that. He gave up his glory with the Father to become a physical man. And then he gave up his life. He gave up everything, brethren. We must be willing to forsake all that we have in, in the future if it becomes necessary. It can't be what's most important to us. We may have to choose between following God or buying and selling or even keeping what we now have. Are we ready for that? Are we really ready for it? Are we moving toward that mindset of being ready for that? Or are physical things or our physical situation more important? We must have the right treasure in our heart and it can't be physical things. In Philippians chapter 3, to save time, we won't turn there, but Paul talks about all things. And he says, he says, I count all things as loss. You see, Paul had this mindset of giving up the physical to follow God. He says that he counted it as rubbish, as rubbish. He gave up everything in his ministry. But the physical was not Paul's treasure. But there was spiritual treasure at the center of Paul's heart. Let's notice, we're here in Matthew. I hope you didn't turn, but Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Matthew 6. No one can serve two masters. And we already alluded to this earlier. For either hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Lotus verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where th thieves do not break in and steal. What is this treasure in heaven? It's many things, brethren, but it is certainly our spiritual growth in the character that we've developed and the spiritual fruits that we've brought about in our lives as we've yielded to God's spirit within us that we talked about earlier. It is also our relationship with God. It is our love for God in our obedience to him, in our love for others. It is our service to God and our willingness to sacrifice and submit to him that we talked about earlier and to serve others and to help others. It is our humility. And it is our reward that Jesus is bringing with him at the last trumpet. It is the vision of our future within us and the hope for glory at the center of our being. That is also part of our treasure in heaven. And it's all spiritual, isn't it? It's not physical where moth and rust can corrupt it and where thieves can break in. It's spiritual. And they must be in our heart, this treasure, not physical treasure. You know, Jesus Christ sums it up in Matthew 6, 33. And I think we're right here and we read it earlier. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's what's important, the spiritual, not the physical. But God pl promises to provide for us, for our needs. But it cannot be as our treasure 
at the center of our heart, brethren. Because here's why. When the time comes and you have to make a stand, if physical treasure is at the center of your heart, you won't be courageous because you'll want to maintain it. So you'll give in. Now is the time, brethren, to build up treasure in heaven, as Jesus said. So let's look at the fifth key, and this one will be a little bit shorter, but this one is to keep watching, to keep watching. We're here in Mark. If you'll turn over to Mark chapter 13, it's not very far away. Mark chapter 13, verse 31. Actually, we were in Matthew before, so we have to go over a book. So it's Mark chapter 13, verse 31. It says, Heaven and earth will pass away, Jesus is saying, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and honor no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. He says, Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to all, watch. We must watch, brethren. You know, Jesus is referring here in this passage we just read to the end of the age and his return. And he tells us to take heed and to watch. Why? So that we can be ready. So that we can be ready. To be spiritually ready. To be spiritually awake. Aware of the world around us. And even more importantly, to be aware of our own spiritual condition. Because we can be caught away, unawares if our spiritual condition is that we are asleep. We don't see it. We don't see what may be coming. We don't see the signs. And when it happens, we're caught completely off guard. And we're brought into the deception that's going to engulf the world. What is our spiritual condition? And I know we examine ourselves in preparation for the Passover. That's going to be coming up in a few months. But we need to be doing that on a constant basis. We can't be a watchman and we watch once a year when we're on every day. Or really bad things are going to happen, aren't they? But notice, brethren, Luke chapter 21, verse 34 through 36. Luke chapter 21, verse 34 through 36. Luke 21, verse 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighted down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. And we talked about that earlier. It's going to be a huge deception and a snare. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Lord. So he says, watch and pray to take heed to be aware of our own spiritual condition and not be weighted down or distracted and burdened down by sin and the cares of this life. To not be spiritually asleep and to be caught unaware, brethren, when the time comes. To not be caught in the snare that is going to be set for the whole world. Jesus tells us, to watch our spiritual condition as well as the situation around us in the world and to pray. Again, tying back to our relationship with God and how important it is so that we don't fall asleep. 
Because brethren, if we are asleep, we will not be spiritually courageous when the time comes. Because we would not have developed what we need to be courageous and we will be deceived, frankly. Romans, <clears throat> pardon me, chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. If you'll turn there, Romans chapter 13, verse 11 through 14. Romans chapter 13. Verse 11 through 14. <clears throat> and do this, Paul writes, knowing the time that and now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Now is the time, brethren, to be fully awake, not caught up in the physical, in the darkness of this world. And we are to walk properly in closeness to God that we've talked about in the first point, in obedience to him, in submitting to him and the Holy Spirit, and to be growing spiritually and to be constantly aware of our spiritual condition. And to do that, brethren, we need to be close to God, by the way, because God will help us to see what we need to see. We need God's help in prayer. So he says, watch and pray is so important because it ties in directly to our relationship with God and we constantly need help. We need to constantly seek that insight into ourselves using our connection with our Father. We must be spiritually awake to develop spiritual courage now. And we must be spiritually awake to be courageous when the time comes. So in conclusion, brethren, today we've looked at five keys to spiritual courage. And as we just read in Romans 13, 11, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. We see this world slide into lawlessness. And that's what it is, lawlessness. And we see darkness building. And we see it accelerating around us. And the stage is being set for momentous events that will lead to the crisis at the end of the age. It's coming. We don't know the exact timing, but it's coming. Are we growing in our relationship with God? Is it truly deep and important to us? Do we truly seek him? And I ask myself as well, do we really love the truth? And is it at the core of our being along with God at the core of our being? And is the vision of the future, our place in the divine family of God, truly real to us? Because if it is, we realize how everything else pales in significance to it. And it's that hope within us. And do we have the right treasure, the things of God and spiritual treasure in our hearts, as opposed to temporary physical treasure? And are we really willing, brethren, to give up and walk away from everything, all the physical things that we have and possess when the time comes, are we really ready? If not, are we trying to be ready? Are we working toward that? Are we watching our spiritual condition with God's help via constant prayer? Are we watching and praying as Jesus said? Let's close with one more scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Paul, this is 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. Paul is writing to the Corinthians. He says, watch. 
Stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Be strong. Be courageous, brethren. With God's help, we can be ready and stand when the time comes. We can and must be spiritually courageous. I hope the remainder of the Sabbath is truly a joy for you.